Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to another session on lifestyle evangelism. Uh, shall we just begin with a word of prayer? Uh, could one of us please lead us in prayer? Oh, what, sir? Uh, can you lead us in prayer, please? Okay. Go ahead. For your presence in the name of Jesus. For this time that you have blessed us, Lord, you bless us as he teaches the word of God. And also you prepare each one of our hearts so that our hearts are receptive, Lord. We commit our life, our session into care in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Watson. All right. Uh, let's just do a quick little review of what we did uh, last week. Uh, last week we looked at, you know, uh, chapter five on getting started how uh, how we need to ask the right questions, ask leading questions. Uh, and it's very important to ask appropriate questions, right? Uh, even during the process of evangelizing. Uh, secondly, we looked at, you know, getting to know the other person's belief systems. Uh, for example, have they been to church? Have they visited? Uh, what do they know about Christianity? Uh, or, or what do they think about God? Uh, so simple questions like that get to know about their belief system. And then we looked at a few approaches uh, also. We looked at the prayer approach where, you know, during evangelizing or, uh, you know, you're uh, trying to share the gospel with your friend or a workplace, uh, your friend at your workplace, prayer approach is a very important approach. So uh, we talked about how prayer is the foundation of our ministry, right? No matter what ministry we are in, uh, whether it is, uh, you know, a pastoral ministry, evangelistic ministry, or, uh, you know, a worship ministry, whatever ministry that God has called us for, prayer is an integral part of that ministry, right? Uh, and so we looked at the importance of prayer, right? Uh, in the book of Acts, we saw how the disciples, uh, even though they were already, you know, filled with the uh, power of the Holy Spirit, they were baptized in the Holy Spirit, yet they spent time in prayer. Right? Uh, they didn't say, okay, I'm able to do this on my own. No, prayer was the integral part. So even as we get opportunities to evangelize, uh, pr the prayer approach, I would say, is the most powerful approach that you and I can use. Because remember, uh, we are just leading people to Christ, but the conviction comes from the Holy Spirit. The, the changing of heart is done by the Holy Spirit. Uh, the breaking of hard hearts is done by the Holy Spirit. We are just, you know, bringing an invitation. We're saying, this is what uh, Jesus did for me, and this is what he can do for your life. So uh, prayer approach is very important. We also looked at how, uh, you know, many people around us will be going through problems, right? Uh, uh, and so you can just immediately ask them, hey, is it okay if I can pray for you? Nine out of 10 times, uh, they would say, yes, uh, please pray for me. And so uh, when we extend our hand in prayer, it's like basically we say, you know, the, you're, the other person is allowing, uh, you know, the Lord to minister into their hearts, right? They may not understand who Jesus is, what he did, uh, but there's a small door that's already open. They are loving the work of the Holy Spirit uh, to begin in their lives, right? Uh, then we also looked at the two-minute testimony approach. Uh, you know, uh, this is what I was. This is what happened to me. I was looking out for a job or I was, I was uh, praying for this healing and uh, I looked to God and the Lord Jesus healed me. And so I believe he can do that even for your life. So the two minute approach and you can always close in prayer. Then we look at the power encounter approach. Now, uh, this is more of a, you know, uh, hitting the nail on the head kind of approach where, um, you know, Jesus did that. Many people were sick. He would go and he would look at that problem and he would bring healing on that problem. The blind man, the lepers, the uh, Lazarus was dead. It was a power encounter approach, right? Then there's the approach of word of knowledge. Right, where you're praying for somebody, you ask God, the Holy Spirit reveals something 
uh, into your lives, into about his life to you. Uh, now, how to get the word of knowledge, how to receive a word of knowledge, uh, you will learn a lot more on that, on the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Um, uh, but here's the thing. The Holy Spirit uh, comes with all nine gifts. And so, uh, you know, Paul writes to Corinthians, he says, uh, I eagerly desire each gift, right? E eagerly desire the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So we as believers can always say, God, I'm going to go minister to this person. And I pray, Lord, that you will give me a word, uh, a word in season for their lives to bless them, to minister to them, right? And so we also looked at how, uh, you know, uh, uh, as his sheep, as God's sheep, uh, the verse in, in the book of John says, his sheep hear my voice, right? So we as his sh sheep, we must hear the shepherd's voice, right? Uh, uh, you know, we may think, how do I hear his voice? How do I uh, un know that it's God speaking to me? How do I know it's not my own emotional thoughts or it's not my own thoughts that is ringing in my head? Now, the Holy Spirit speaks to us directly through his word he speaks to us through a prompting a leading uh, so you will learn a lot of that later as well right so and then the other approach is prophecies this is a powerful approach right so you're you're prophesying over that person hey after you know you prayed for somebody you can say hey you know what i i felt like this i felt that you know uh, right now you're in this season but god is taking you to this other season uh, where you know uh, he's going to open doors for you a prophetic word uh, at the right time will also be able to touch people's lives and then you have miraculous interventions uh, you know you just pray for a job or uh, you know college admissions uh, financial breakthroughs. So you're praying directly for those needs. Uh, and, and the Lord is faithful, right? Uh, always remember this. Initially, the mistake that I made was I used to think, okay, God, how are you going to do this? He's been praying for this financial breakthrough for like 10 years. Now, just because I pray once, is it going to happen? Is the breakthrough going to happen? There were these thoughts. Now, remember that uh, we are not... Uh, the saviors, right? Meaning we are not the people who are going to uh, save that person or help that person, but it's the work of God, right? So you you can release yourself from every burden that we have, right? I had that burden. I used to say, okay, God, he's, God, he's having this uh, marital problem for the past five years with just one prayer. Is he going to, is things going to be all right? Uh, so, there were sometimes these doubts come in. Now, remember that uh, fear and doubt negate faith. They, they break faith at its path, right? So we need to bring it out of our minds. All we're doing is we're allowing the Holy Spirit, we're allowing God to work in that person's lives, right? So then we also too looked at um, you know, taking appropriate steps. There are times when people will accept Christ, right? And then you, uh, if you have brought them to Christ, take appropriate steps, right? Uh, give them a book, gospel of the book of John and let them read it, ask them questions, right? They may not understand anything, right? Lead them, get them you know, connected to, uh, you know, small groups, uh, uh, keep asking them, how is their walk with God? Uh, you know, uh, remember that the enemy is trying to, you know, deceive them or pull them back to uh, to his fold. So we need to follow up with them. And then later on in this uh, whole course, we will study about a little bit about discipleship and how discipleship is also important. Um, and also, you know, pray for them continually, uh, invite them to small groups, you know, go ahead and uh, ask them to feel free to ask questions. Uh, from what they've studied. So these are just practical things that you and I can do. Then we also looked at rules of engagement. Now, uh, show genuine love and care. Don't look at them as projects. Don't be judgmental. Uh, that is a very, very dangerous thing to do. The moment we say, okay, you people are like this and you people are like that, we have lost them there itself. They're not going to listen to us. Right. Uh, avoid arguments. Sometimes debates get into arguments. Just just stop it and walk out of those arguments. Uh, 
there will be times people will uh, respond negatively to you and to the gospel. Uh, but don't let it pull you down. Just go ahead, continue what God has called you to do. So today we'll get into chapter six. Before that, any thoughts, any questions anybody has? Any of us want to share anything? Uh, has, has anyone been able to share the gospel uh, to anyone uh, over this past one week or over the month? Or anybody who was able to you know, uh, share? I know COVID's happening. A lot of things are going online. But anybody was able to share the gospel uh, maybe with your friend? Yes, go ahead. Uh, uh, Abu Kabre, right? I hope I got that right. Yeah. Go yes. ahead. Good morning. Good morning. I have a question. I want to ask a question. Go ahead. And my question is, I have someone around me. I've been praying for him to meet Jesus Christ. That's because I want to preach about Jesus Christ to him. But the moment I started praying for him, his attitude changed towards me. We used to talk before, we used to discuss before, but the moment that God laid it in my heart to pray for him, pray for his souls, I discover that, uh, that since that time, anytime we we see each other, he will be angry at me. And even at times, if I ask him a question or if I greet him, he may not answer me. How am I going to handle that short case? Yes. I don't know what to do. That's why. Yes, that's a good question, uh, uh, brother. So here's the thing. Firstly, uh, we need to understand that the moment we are sharing the gospel with a friend or somebody that we know, it is a spiritual battle, right? It's something, it's a spiritual thing. Now you talk about, for example, you're talking about music or you're talking about books and you know regular stuff. Everything's fine, right? The moment you talk about the cross, the moment you bring in the gospel, uh, it becomes a spiritual battle. Now, the Bible very clearly teaches us that the God of this age has blinded the eyes of the people, right? So what happens is when sometimes the enemy is oppressing people in different ways, right? So there could be sickness, there could be oppression in the mind, oppression in the body, oppression in, 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 in physical ailments. So here's the thing. When we share the gospel, right, it is the work of the Holy Spirit. So it is a spiritual battle, right? But we are just talking, okay, you know what? Uh, Jesus came, he died on the cross, uh, and he took all our sins. Simple two-minute gospel. Even though that two minutes is a spiritual battle, right? So we must understand that, you know, even uh, they may be a good friend of yours for many years, but the moment we share the gospel, there's a change in their attitudes. Now, remember, it's not them, right? It is the work of the enemy trying to deviate their mind, trying to bring their uh, minds into a place where, you know, to blind them from this gospel, right? To blind their minds, to blind their eyes from seeing the truth of the gospel, right? So it's very common where people will you know, uh, uh, you're sharing the gospel and they would, you know, just they'd be good friends. They'll be all right. But the moment you share gospel, uh, they, you know, get upset. They get angry. They treat you differently. Uh, so it's a common thing, uh, Abu Bakre. But uh, here's the thing that we should do. We are to go back and pray and ask the Holy Spirit to, you know, uh, ask God to break that hardness of heart to stop the work of the enemy uh, that is you know it's the work of the enemy so never look at the person and say okay he was like this now that i'm sharing the gospel he's like this so it's better i just walk away or better i just you know don't talk to him like how i was before but we are to there's this whole part of sacrifice that we have to do we have to go back to god and say god as i minister to this person give me the grace 
uh, and as I share the gospel with him, give me opportunities. Give me, uh, you know, you can try the power encounter approach. Give me a word of knowledge. Give me a prophetic word that he will listen to me and uh, open an opportunity that he will listen to me. And almost every time, God will open some door for each of us. Right? Uh, there will come a time, Abu Bakr, as you keep praying, keep praying for him. Keep praying that the enemy will not, uh, you know, blind him. But there will come a time when he will come and ask you uh, to pray. Uh, he will come and ask you, you know, this is what's happening. What do I do? Then you can, you know, uh, very freely give him the gospel. But the back, you know, the background work of praying has to be done by you. You need to pray. And you can just say, God, I, I command every work of the enemy to be broken off into that person's life, uh, every oppression to be broken off, every chain to be broken off. Let the anointing of the Holy Spirit break every yoke in his life. And even as I pray, give me wisdom. So these are things that you can pray, Abu Bakr. So don't be discouraged that, you know, uh, you know, at times they may, if they are continually, you know, against what you're saying, give it some time, right? Don't talk about it because it's better to be his friend than to than for him to just shut you off and then you wouldn't get any opportunity. So uh, look at right opportunities, right? At the right time uh, and bring in the gospel. So uh, that's what I would like to share with you. I hope that helps you, Abu Bakr. Thank you very much. I'm here, yeah. I appreciate sir. God bless, God bless. Right, any other thoughts, any other questions you have? Uh, we can move ahead to chapter six. By the way, did anyone, uh, was anyone able to share the gospel? Maybe even if it was on the phone or on, on through message, or meeting people, anyone? No? Okay. Uh, okay, I'll share just what happened uh, during the week uh, just to help us all. Uh, uh, I was at the supermarket and uh, buying some things and the moment i went in i saw this uh, young man he was, he was you know just looking around walking around uh, and you know many of them come to the supermarket so i just thought nothing to so i bought the stuff and as i was going out i felt the holy spirit say speak to him right now it was raining and you know i had an umbrella and i had things in my hand and I said, oh man, how am I going to wait for this guy to come out? And it's going to look so funny standing outside the supermarket with all the things. And I don't even have the invites with me. And I was standing there saying, God, can I just go home now? Uh, uh, but uh, I actually went to the bar, to my vehicle and I, I thought I'll start the vehicle. But somewhere in my heart, I said, okay, let me just try to talk to him. And so I stood out in the rain. It was really weird to stand there. and. Um, Anyways, he stood there and uh, after about 10, 15 minutes, this guy comes out and I said, uh, I don't know how to st start the conversation. So I just said, uh, hey, are you from Mangalore? He said, no, I'm, I'm from a different town, I'm from Mumbai. Uh, and I said, hey, can I just talk to you for a moment? He said, no, no, I got to go. I said, God, you made me wait here for 15 minutes with all this stuff in the rain. And now this guy is not willing to go. So he just started walking off. right? But then he took a turn back and he said, uh, oh, what do you want to talk to me about? Uh, what is it? Well, can I know what your name is and all that? So he just asked me those guys. I said, okay, my name's Paul. And this is what uh, I just want to talk to you about what God did in my life. You no, know, I don't want to know about God and all of that he started. So uh, I said, no, I just want to share. You know, uh, as I was talking to him, I, I could get, you know, smell of alcohol. And so I asked him directly, um, are you, uh, are you into drugs or anything? He said, yes. Uh, and then I said, see, this is what happened in my life, you know, where God was able to change my life and for the better. And, um, and right there, I began to share about what Jesus was doing, uh, did, in our, in, did in my life personally. And uh, uh, I didn't have an invite, nothing I had, but I, I, I shared with him the whole gospel. I said, this is what Jesus can do. He can change your life. He can turn your life around. Uh, and during the conversation, I got to know that he ran away from Mumbai 
uh, because of his uh, drug addiction, his his parents threw him out of the house, and then he couldn't get anything in Mumbai. So he's come here, and he's doing some small job here, and uh, and so I was able to just bring in the gospel. He didn't say, "Oh, hallelujah," and kneel down there. No, right? He just said, "Okay." Uh, uh, and then I said, took down his number. I said, "Let's send you some, you know, words that can help you, that can encourage you." And so that happened. I took down his phone number. So over the week, I'm just, you know, sending him messages. Uh, he hasn't responded to a few of them, uh, but I'm praying for him. Uh, so this is just one off that happened last week. Uh, so I want to encourage you, all right? Uh, even as you may step out, I know COVID's happening everywhere. Uh, but if you get opportunities like this, right, go ahead, be bold, be strong, uh, trust God, right? Uh, Trust God that he is with you. The Holy Spirit is with you. Uh, don't be afraid. Uh, it may be a little bit embarrassing. I prayed for him on the street and he was, you know, with a cigarette in his mouth as I was praying for him. And it, it looked really funny. But uh, but I believe that God is going to do a work in his life. Right. So, uh, so I encourage you to also step out and minister to people. Okay. Let's go to chapter 6. John chapter 1. Verse 35 to 51. Can one of us please read that? John chapter 1. Let's put that up. John chapter 1. 35 to 51. Go ahead. Can somebody please read that? Right. John... Uh, can you please read uh, John chapter 1, 35 to 51? Is it 45 or 35? It's 35, 35 to 35. 51. Right. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, what are you, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So then, so they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent the day, that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the other two who heard that what, G, what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, Follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathaniel and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth, can any good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, He truly is an Israel, Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus said, you believe because I told you, I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. He then added, very truly I tell you, you will see the heaven open and angel of God ascending and descending, angels of God ascending and descending on the son of man. Right. Thank you, John. Uh, so in this entire chapter, we're going to focus on something called as, uh, you know, Pointing based on trust. Now, before this, uh, or later on also, uh, John the Baptist points to Jesus and says, this is the, son, the, uh, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And, uh, you know, Andrew joins Jesus. So it was simple words pointing based on trust in the sense that Andrew and his disciples, uh, sorry, John the Baptist and his disciples, his disciples trusted John the Baptist that when he said, behold, the son of man, 
uh, who will uh, take away the, the Lamb of God who will take away the sins of the world. They did not go to John the Baptist and say, uh, are you sure this is what you, are you sure about this statement? Are you sure? Did you read the scriptures? Did you go open the book of Isaiah? Did you, uh, no, they didn't question him at all. They 100% trusted in John the Baptist, right? 100% trust. Uh, but later on, we see that Nathaniel uh, did not have a 100% trust on uh, uh, Philip, but, but here, there was, there was so much of trust. John the Baptist said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And Andrew follows him. Right? They did not question what John the Baptist was saying. Now, here is an important point. As we are ministering to people, we need to gain people's trust. How do I, how do I, uh, how do we gain people's trust? Now, we're not gaining people's trust to please them, but we need to honor, uh, you know, friendships and, and people around us. And so, so, for example, if you've got a friend, right, he's maybe an unbeliever, a uh, person from another faith, right, and you make commitments, hey, I'll come and pick you up at 8 o'clock in the morning, right, and you go there at 9 o'clock, and he is on the road there, eight to nine, waiting for you. Right? Now, what happens? You know, that whole level of trust comes down. Right? It's just a simple uh, point that I'm giving. Right? Uh, or say, for example, you've made certain commitments. Right? And, and very easily, we break those commitments. So what happens? The relationship or the trust that we have on each other will tend to break down. So here's an important point. Now, there will be times, many of us are in ministry, there will be times we have to you know, uh, change our schedules and uh, make changes to what we are doing. But here's the thing, as much as possible, keep your commitments, gain the trust of your friends. Now, why do I say this? Now, if, I'm, if, if somebody trusts me completely and they say, okay, hey, oh, Paul said he'll come and pick me up at 8. So he should be here by 7.55, 8. Uh, I know that Paul won't be late unless, you know, there's something happened on the road and there's, you know, the whole street was blocked. And uh, But otherwise, he should be here. Now, the same way, if I tell that friend, hey, why don't you come to this youth meeting? Uh, uh, it's really good because I enjoyed myself. Maybe you will also like it. Now, he's not going to check with 100 other people uh, uh, what about this church? He's not going to go on Google and check, okay, how is this church? Is it a church? Uh, is it Christian? He's not going to do all that. Just based on trust that we have developed, he will be willing to come. Now, it may not be that at the first time you say, yes, yes, I'll come. But he's open to the idea. Why? Because he trusts me. Right? You get what I'm saying, right? So it's very important as Christians, as believers, to keep our appointments, right? To keep our words. The book of Proverbs is filled with that, right? He's, uh, the book of Proverbs teaches us about discipline and how it is very important to be disciplined in our life. Now, a lot of people think, okay, ministry is just, okay, we can do whatever we want at whatever time, however we like it. No. Uh, God expects us to be disciplined, right? Uh, whether we are pastors, evangelists, prophets, whatever it is, uh, there's a discipline that we have to follow, right? Get up, read the word, pray, spend time in his presence and do the other practical things. There are times when we seek God uh, more than we do normally, times of fasting, times of uh, complete dedication to the word of God. And so all of this is there. So here's what I say. Here's what I want to leave us in this point. There are times that because of trust we have developed, when we point people to Jesus, they will be willing to, you know, uh, listen to us. They'll be willing to listen to us. Now, for example, if I'm somebody, I'm a friend with someone and, uh, you know, he, I'm friends with him for the past 10 years. And over the past 10 years, I've always been, you know, uh, uh, changing my commitments, changing my words, always being late, always doing things that is, you know, whatever I say, uh, I don't do. So what happens is uh, I don't have the trust 
They may be friends with you, but I don't gain that trust uh, that I really need from them. Right? They may say, hey, Paul, okay, uh, if he doesn't come, it's all right. Because most of the times he always, uh, you know, cancels on us or he most of the time he doesn't come on time. So it's all right. We can just continue. But that's the attitude that people will have. Right. So here's the thing. When we are, you know, respectful to other people's time and and and, uh, you know, their availability and their commitments and their, and things that they have to do when we gain their trust, it is very important to do that because when we invite them to places, they will be willing to come, right? In 2012, uh, you know, I have a I have a lot of Muslim friends, right? So uh, this Muslim friend of mine, he's, we are very good friends, right? From the time we were in school, uh, very good friends, very close to each other. Uh, he was a notorious boy. Uh, and, and so he would always get into trouble. But one thing was from, from a young age, I used to tell him, no need of hiding it. Just go tell your parents. It's going to become worse later on. So he would just go and, you know, do it. So he he really trusted me, right? Uh, not that I was a very good person, but he really trusted in what I would say. And, uh, and then I became a believer. And, you know, our relationship did not change. Right? We're still in touch. And I remember this one time, I just told him, uh, hey, uh, uh, why don't you just come with me? He said, where? Uh, see, I'm going to this place, the church. You just come with me. He said, okay, Paul, I'll come. Uh, he, then I asked him, he said, it's okay, no? Your parents won't shout. No, no, they won't shout. He said, no, they won't shout. Uh, are you going to tell your parents you're going? He said, no, now I won't tell. But uh, maybe this, if I've come the second or third time, I'll tell them. Uh, but if I tell them I'm going with Paul, it's no problem. They won't say anything, even now. But if I tell them I'm going with Paul, they won't say anything. If I tell them I'm going somewhere else, they would get worried, right? So, so I I told this boy he's a hardcore Muslim. Right? I said, why don't you come? Because there are a lot of people, uh, young people, and you can get to meet people. You're always at home, and all, all your friends are not good friends, you know. Uh, so you come to church. He just came. Right? He never asked anything. He never asked me, uh, are they going to talk about Jesus? Are they going to talk about this? Nothing. Right? He came. He sat with me in church. He listened to the whole worship. He listened to the whole uh, sermon. Then he asked me a lot of questions. I answered those questions. He trusted me. Uh, now, it was not that he gave his life to Christ immediately. right? Uh, so after that, I had to keep talking to him. But the more I spoke to him, the more he trusted me. Because it was not some relationship built on one year, two years, right? 10 years. And in that 10 years, I was able to keep commitments. I was able to keep my word in the smallest of things. So he completely trusts me, right? Uh, uh, he trusts me with everything, you know, uh, even to the point that, you know, when he goes uh, to other countries, he gives me his house key. He says, you only keep. I don't want to give it to anybody. So he's got complete trust on me. Now, whenever I call him to church, I tell him about Jesus. I tell him about the cross. I tell him, see, this is what happened in my life. Right? I keep telling him that. Uh, but somewhere, he he because you know he's heard it so many times, it's he's not yet able to, you know, uh, digest it. But I know that one day he will you know, accept Christ. He loves the whole gospel. He reads a lot of the Bible. He reads it. He, he knows a lot of songs. He listens to gospel songs uh, because I send it to him. He listens to it because he trusts me. Right. So here's the thing, what I'm trying to bring. Uh, when you and I have, like how Abu Bakr was saying, I have a, he has a friend, gain their trust, right? Be caring, loving to them, honor your commitments. And then, you will be able to speak into their lives. John the Baptist had his disciples and two of his disciples, he just said, behold, the Lamb of God takes away the sins of the world. They trusted him and they went to Jesus. Later on, they became disciples of Jesus. They did not question John the Baptist at all. Right? So that's a very important point. Secondly, we see that in, in that same chapter, verse 40 to 42, we see that, uh, you know, uh, uh, Andrew goes and finds his brother, Simon Peter, right? Now, 
here is something very interesting. They, you know, uh, uh, Andrew Andrew spent time with Jesus, and he goes and he tells him, "We have found the Messiah," and brings him to where Jesus is. The Lord ministers to Peter, and you know, we know what happens to Peter. He went on to become the leader of the church, leader of the. Uh, you know, uh, the church in Jerusalem and and we know the powerful work that uh, Apostle Peter did. All of this happened because Andrew went and told Peter, we have found the Messiah. So it was a common interest, both Andrew and Peter being brothers. They were Jews. They were waiting for the Messiah. Right? They all know they were waiting for the Messiah. And so uh, they had something in common. And that same that same thing of the common aspect was able to bring both of them to Jesus. Andrew was convinced that Jesus was the Messiah. He goes out, he finds his brother, brings Peter and says, "You, I am convinced, you yourself meet him and you will see that you will also be convinced. Common interest, common search, right? So there will be times when, you know, in ministry, there will be, common things that people are searching for, right? Uh, people may be looking for, you know, uh, a, a place of, uh, you know, a, a place where they can be accepted, right? a place where they can, you know, find loving friends. So common interests. So you get people in that way. So if, you, if for example, you know somebody who's, uh, you know, uh, always you know or wanting to you know be a uh, have good friends around invite your church friends invite your good friends get them connected uh -huh. you never know you know they can uh, come to christ as well uh, through that so uh, sharing based on common interest now next thing that we can see is that what did andrew say he said come and see Andrew did not go and explain everything to uh, Peter. He didn't say, okay, uh, uh, Peter, you know what happened? I was going here and then I went here. I met this man and then it is written in the book of Isaiah like this about him. He was like this. He did this. He did this. Uh, and he's the Messiah. So just like that, I met one person. He also claimed to be the Messiah. And when I spoke to him, my heart was moved and I began to, you know, really believe him. And now I believe him. And then I took all. No. No explanation. All that Andrew said was, Peter, come and see what I saw. Right? Come and see what I saw. I'll give you this example. Uh, during the early days in Mangalore, we were about 20 odd people. And one day, uh, I was at a, I think it was a juice shop or something, and uh, buying my little boy a juice. And during that time, I saw this young man Right, he was a northeast boy. Uh, I felt in my heart to just share the gospel with him, and so I went to him and I said, "Hey, uh, uh, I just want to share uh, the gospel with you." He said, "Hey, I'm a Christian." He said, "I've just come to Manglo uh, just a month ago, and I'm here. Uh, I study in a university which is about 15, 20 kilometers away." Um, I said, hey, that's great. Why uh, we have a church here? If you're looking for a church, I gave him an invite. And sure enough, he was very excited. He came the next Sunday, right? As he came the next Sunday, he said, hey, you know what? I have like 15 friends, all from uh, Nagaland and, uh, uh, you know, Dimapur, Nagaland, uh, and from the Northeast, a few of our friends, and we're all in one batch. So can I bring all of them and come? I said, yes, please bring all the Christians. Okay. So he brought all of them, about 10, 15 of them. All of a sudden, from 20, we were 35 people in the church. Now, here's the thing. After the first time, not many of them would come. Three, four people would come. And so I, I met with this boy, uh, and I told him, why aren't they coming? He said, uh, no, they're like that. You know, the, the games, they play video games. They want to rest on Sunday. Uh, so then we, then we were discussing. We thought, okay, what is a common interest among all of them? So he said, we like movies. We like watching movies and all of that. So I said, okay, tell them. So we made an invite, okay, movie night in church. Right now we we have these movies called Facing the Giant. Uh, you know, uh, so many movies, right? Uh, 
prayer room or something. I'm not good at those. Uh, Facing the giant, uh, flying wheel, all these uh, Christian movies which have a lot of uh, meaning to them. I said, okay, we are going to have a movie evening. So I made an, we made an invite and uh, we sent it out to people. We did an e-invite. We, so we sent it out. We said, okay, Saturday, 5 p.m., movie is going to start in church. Right? So we got everything ready. We had our projectors, everything set up. The entire gang came, 20 people. And they said, hey, we've called our friends also. That night, that movie time, we had about 45 people. I didn't expect 45 people. I ordered coffee for about 20 people. Uh, 45 people turned up. We sat. They watched the entire movie Facing the Giants. After the movie, I went in front. I just very simply, I brought in the gospel. I said, uh, you know, there are giants that we face in, in life. And uh, this is what God has given us. Uh, God has given us the authority to overcome the giant, just broaden a little bit of David and Goliath, a little bit of the things of the world, just brought in a simple message, five minutes, gave it to them, did an altar call, four people came forward, gave their lives to Christ, and it was wonderful, right? It was all through a movie. I spoke for five minutes, that's it. But the, the movie itself uh, ministered to them. Right, and then the next week onwards, they all started coming to church. Right now, most of them have uh, graduated; they've gone back to their hometown. Some of them are here, uh, but they still remember. They say, uh, "You know, Pastor, when when I when you when are you opening church? We want to come, uh, and we want to be part of church." How did it happen? Just common interest. Now, if I had gone there saying, okay, you know, this is what, open the book of John, open, you know, Isaiah and all of it, nothing's going to happen. They know everything. They're all Christians, right? Uh, they know everything about Jesus. They know the cross. They know everything. But common interest, right? Uh, there's another time when, you know, the few students here in the city, they wanted to learn music. So they said, I said, see, I'm not a very good teacher or anything. What I know, I know a little bit of guitar. So whatever little I know, I can teach you. So uh, so they said, okay, sure. So I said, okay, Saturday you come. So they came, like two, three of them. And then five, six of them would come. And then while playing the guitar, I would, you know, teaching them just simple stuff. Uh, you know, I don't know the theory, and but whatever simple things that I know, I would teach them, but I would bring in the gospel. I would say, you know what? So many people don't have the ability to you know, don't have hands, don't have legs. You have hands and you have a mind where you're able to remember all that you're learning now. Don't you feel God has blessed you? Don't you feel you have to give praise to God? And, you know, press bring in the gospel in a simple way. Now, it, it may sound radical, uh, but it's in a very simple way. Common interest, bringing people to Christ. Right? So you can think of other things, right? You can look at your church, you look at your youth leaders, ask them. Hey, what what is happening in among the youth? What are the interests that are happening now with things in the, you know, gaming and these phones and technology and all of it? Uh, see how you can bring in technology and help your church people. You know, maybe you can have a meeting. Uh, you know, get somebody to talk about uh, improvements of technology and how it's going to impact the church, uh, right? Uh, and and so you can try all these things within your church. Now, some, some of you may be in a setting where it's more of a town or more of a village, not a city, uh, but it's all right. Uh, you know, there are, uh, you know, when we look at surveys now, even the small, smallest villages have Zoom prayers now, right? So everyone are aware of, you know, technology at some certain level, at least, uh, at least 10 years back, they were not. So you can use it. I don't feel that, okay, they don't know. You can teach them, right? Uh, uh, then as you do this, invite them and pray for them. Don't forget to do that, right? It should not be a time only of enjoyment, right? Like for the movie, not just enjoyment, but in the end, invite them for prayer. Give them an opportunity to encounter and explore Jesus for themselves. Pray that the Lord will reveal himself to their lives, right? Uh, here's another important thing. Realize the power of a single invitation. A single invitation is powerful, right? There are plenty of examples in church history uh, where this one person invited another person 
and they did exploits for the kingdom of God. Andrew invited Peter. Peter did exploits for the kingdom of God. Single invitation. Right? I invited this young boy, one person. I never knew in my mind he's going to bring 30 people. He said it. And he brought the people. I never knew it was a single invitation. One person. And for me, this one person, if he comes, it was enough. You know, but he brought in so many people. So realize the power of a single invitation. Never look down on one invitation, also. Right? They're able to do this. Uh, let me give you this example of uh, Billy Graham. Uh, Billy Graham was a young boy, small boy. Uh, and so his parents would tell him, You need to go to Sunday school. So during those times, uh, you know, they had elderly men who would you know have handled sunday school uh, uh late 1800s and and so billy graham was going to his uh children's uh school children's church i would say and there this old man was handling the sunday school very old man right uh, he would come he would sweep the place mop the place uh, put the chairs, and there would be seven children coming. For the seven children, you know, people would ask him, you know, sir, you're so old, right? Uh, you're so advanced in age, but you are coming here, you're cleaning the whole place, you're setting everything right. And for seven people in the children's church, he said, you never know what these children can do for the Lord. So he was very, very faithful. Right. And so it was during one of those Sunday school servants, this man, I forget his name, but he made an altar call. He said, uh, those who want to accept Christ as their personal savior, come in front. Billy Graham came in front. And in that hall, he knelt down. He gave his life to Christ. Did he know that he will be touching millions of lives all across the world? Power of a single invitation. Remember that sometimes, you know, God can use you to raise up a Billy Graham. That's one, one invitation, right? So think of various situations that people go through. Give them an opportunity where you can invite them to explore Jesus. The challenges they face, the point of interest they have, being grateful, being thankful, media, uh, you know, so many things. Don't put pressure on people during the process of evangelizing. Right? They say, wow, I accept Christ. Good. Don't say, okay, next step, get baptized. Go to baptism. Next step, fast for 40 days. Now, they won't be able to do all of that. Right? They accepted Christ. Give them some time. Right? Take it slow. Give them milk. And then you slowly give them the meat of the word of God. Right? Don't put pressure on them. Right. There's this uh, one uh, lady who comes to our church. She's a Hindu. Uh, she's been coming every Sunday for three years. Three years, every Sunday. I've done so many altar calls. She's never come in front. She's still, you know, here and there. You know, sometimes she'll have her God. Sometimes she'll say Jesus and all of that. Here and there. She knows the entire gospel. She knows what Jesus did. And all. But one day I asked her, why is it? that you know you're so faithful to church three years you know even though you've not accepted jesus you know, i i was curious i asked him, you haven't accepted him as your personal savior in the sense that you still have these other things i'm very open because she she's been with us for three years now and she said something this world has so much of trouble and pain for me in my mind i eagerly long for sundays because when I come into this place, I feel the peace of God. That's what the, her answer was. Right? I eagerly long for Sundays. She is one of the first few people who comes into church. She's a Hindu still, right? She's both here and there, right? Uh, but she said this, I eagerly long. And I can make out that she does eagerly long because she's there on time. And she's there till the end. She talks to everyone eagerly long because when I come into this place I feel the peace of God I forget about all my worries all my fears I feel like staying here itself right now it's wonderful that people feel that way right so don't put pressure on them 
right? Give them their time. God is doing a work in their lives. Continue to give them the gospel. Give them their time, right? Uh, again, just like before, uh, we looked at there are various events and various places that you can invite people to explore Jesus, your church, church events, life groups, uh, special movie, a home, uh, you know, uh, there's this one time, I'll close with this last uh, example that happened in church. Uh, this one time we said, okay, let's have a potluck in church because uh, all of a sudden the families started growing in church so i said okay families i realized that families don't know other families i would talk to one family i'll say okay this person they will be blank so they didn't know who's that so i realized that they don't know each other in the church i mean they know them by face but not by name and what they do so i said okay let's have potluck i said uh, you can invite your other people other friends as well if they want to come and uh, a few of them invited uh other families, right? Uh, people from other faith. And it was nothing. It was just potluck. It was some games. We had some games. And then we had potluck. Eat together, go back home. That's all the plan was. Uh, but on that event, that day, uh, two, uh, two Hindu couples came. Uh, and so we had the games, everything. And uh, while we were having the meal, uh, it's just very simple. I just tried to bring in the gospel while having me. I said, see, uh, you know, uh, we all have uh, good health, good strength, you know, uh, and here's what it is. When God created us, he created us for a purpose. And so I just try to connect with food. Uh, I don't know if that message even made sense because I was not even prepared, but I just tried to bring in the gospel and, um, Sure enough, after that, uh, these two couples started slowly coming to church and uh, they began to, you know, uh, attend church regularly. Uh, but one couple did not turn up, one couple turned up and it was through potluck, right? Uh, so the reason I'm giving these examples is so that God gives us wisdom, especially us who are leading a church, pastors, uh, you know, to to be wise in the way we lead the church. God has called us not to be people who put down others, not to look down and mock and ridicule others. I always say this, and even at APC, we always focus on this. That is, uh, you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Don't focus on what others are doing. Oh, you're worshiping this God and that God. No. They shall know the truth, and the truth itself will set them free. So our focus uh, as uh, leaders, as pastors, as evangelists, as ministers of God, is to focus on the truth and let the truth set them free. Not to focus on what is wrong and what wrong people are doing and then bring in the truth. No. Yes, people are doing wrong. But you bring in the truth, the truth will set them free from that wrong. Right? So I just want to leave us with that. Focus on the truth. Let the truth of the word of God prevail in our hearts. And God will be able to use each of us in greater ways known. All right. So we'll wrap up today's class. Sorry, I've taken five minutes extra. But uh, right. can any questions, any thoughts? Uh, should we just close in prayer? Okay, let's let's close in prayer. Elisha, uh, can you please close in prayer? Okay, okay, Pastor. Okay. We are praying. Our Heavenly Father, we want to praise you and thank you for this wonderful moment. That we thank you and appreciate you for the words of encouragement and insight that Pastor Paul has shared with us. We continue to pray the Lord. Let this, let this truth of your word grip our hearts, that we will be encouraged, Father, and inspired to share you, Jesus Christ, with our loved ones and our family. Father, the path of trust that he shared with us, we pray that you continue to let your Holy Spirit work on us, that we will shed off every attitude of indiscipline that will keep our family and friends not trusting us 
in the mighty name of Jesus. We pray that you continue to help us to keep to our word in the name of Jesus. We pray, commit our unbelieving friends and family into your hands, O oh God. Continue to let your Holy Spirit work on them as we continue to pray and evangelize them, that it touch their hearts and bring them to conviction of sin, judgment, in the mighty name of Jesus. We thank you and honor your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Sorry, thank you, Elisha. Uh, before we just close, I just want to encourage us, uh, maybe this week, if you can get an opportunity to share the gospel with somebody, go ahead and try it out. And if you do, maybe next week we can spend some time uh, learning from that so that all of us can also learn together. So but I want to encourage you, if you get an opportunity, go ahead, share it, whether it's uh, on the phone or face-to-face, -face, go ahead with boldness. All right. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. We'll catch up next Wednesday. God bless.